Now it's time for the last word with Lawrence O'Donnell. Good evening, Lawrence. Good evening, Alex. And it's just a viewer <clears throat> warning. I have been struggling with my voice a bit today from the minor cold. And I assure you, as you know, Alex, I am alone in a room with my germs a threat to no one except myself as, as I do this. Well, we worry um, about your health, be. too, Lawrence. You're there, one there of our great orators. Here and there. That voice is and, a golden and, and box. Alex, I, in, in so much of what we've seen uh, President Obama do over the years, I, I don't know that he's ever given a speech that was so full of ridicule of Donald Trump <laughs> as, as he did tonight. And, uh, and viewers of this hour are going, going to see every bit of that ridicule of Donald Trump. Yes, it was ridicule with a capital R, and nothing bothers Donald Trump yep. more than being made fun of, <laughs> right. especially by Barack Obama. Yeah, it was Obama. so targeted, so targeted at Donald Trump. Well, I'm sure there'll will, be big Trump reaction to it. Yes, I will be rewatching all the hits in your hour. Right. Okay. Thanks, Have a good Alex. Show. Thank you. Well, the breaking news of this hour is that Vice President Harris just wrapped up a rally near Phoenix, Arizona, where early voting is already underway. The election is here. The election is here, and we've got to energize and organize and mobilize. And please, let's always remember, your vote is your voice, and your voice is your power. And so, Arizona, I ask you, are you ready to make your voices heard? We will bring you more of what the vice president had to say at that rally in Arizona later in this hour. Donald Trump's undying jealousy of President Barack Obama was on full display today. If I were named Obama, I would have had the Nobel Prize given to him in 10 seconds. He, would, he got the Nobel Prize. He didn't even know what the hell he got it for. Remember, he got elected. Well, so did I. He got elected, and they announced he was getting the Nobel Prize. Remember, he said, oh... What did I do? He didn't know what the hell he did. He got the Nobel Prize for doing nothing, he, for getting elected. But I got elected, too. Donald Trump is surely feeling much worse about Barack Obama <clears throat> after it, President Obama delivered his first speech for the Harris for President campaign earlier this evening in Pittsburgh. One of President Obama's recurring themes was making fun of Donald Trump. Donald Trump is a 78-year-old billionaire who has not stopped whining about his problems <laughs> since he rode down his golden escalator nine years ago. I, you, you, you've got the, the, the tweets in all caps, the, the ranting and the raving about crazy conspiracy theories. you got the, 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 the two-hour speeches, word salad, just, you know, it's like uh, Fidel Castro, it's just on and on. Constant attempts to, to sell you stuff. Who does that? <laughs> Selling you gold sneakers and a $100,000 watch and, and most recently a Trump Bible. Uh, you know, he, he wants you to buy the Word of God, Donald Trump edition. He got his name right there ne next to Matthew and Luke. I, <laughs> I mean, you could not make this stuff up. If you saw it on Saturday Night Live, you'd say, well, no, that's, I mean, that's going too far. No, he's doing that. It, it's, it's, it's crazy. And, and the reason he does it is because all he cares about is his ego and his money and his status. He's not thinking about you. Donald Trump sees power as nothing more than a means to an end. He wants the middle class to pay the price for another huge tax cut that would mostly help him and his country club buddies. Doesn't care if he costs more women their reproductive freedoms because it won't make a difference in his life. Do, do not boo. Vote. <laughs> they can't hear your boos, but they can hear your votes.
Most of all, Donald Trump wants us to think that this country is hopelessly divided between us and them, between the quote-unquote real Americans who support him and the outsiders who don't. Because having people divided and angry, he figures boosts his chances of being elected. And he doesn't care who gets hurt. I mean, think about it. Just the other day, we learned that on January 6th, a couple years ago, Donald Trump was told that Mike Pence was in the Capitol about 40 feet from an angry mob chanting, hang Mike Pence. And his response was, quote, so what? Don't boo. <laughs> if Donald Trump does not care that a mob might attack his own vice president, do you think he cares about you? Even while praising Kamala Harris and Tim Waltz, President Obama could not resist making fun of Donald Trump. Kamala is as prepared for the job as any nominee for president has ever been. That's who Kamala is. And in the White House, she will have an outstanding partner in Governor Tim Walsh. Tim is a veteran, he is a teacher, he's a coach, he's a hunter, he's been a great governor working with Democrats and Republicans to get stuff done. He can also take a vintage truck apart and put it back together again. You think Donald Trump can do that? <laughs> For that matter, <laughs> Do you think Donald Trump has ever changed a tire in his life? <laughs> I'm just trying to picture it. <laughs> President Obama reminded everyone what the economy was like when Donald Trump took the oath of office. Reason some people think, well, I don't know, I remember that economy when he first came in being pretty good. Yeah, it was pretty good. Because it was my economy. <laughs> we had had 75 straight months of job growth that I handed over to him. It wasn't something he did. I had spent eight years cleaning up the mess that the Republicans had left me the last time. So just in case everybody has a hazy memory, <laughs> that, that, that was, he, didn't, he didn't do nothing except those big tax cuts. And President Obama ridiculed the Trump tariff plan. His other big economic plan now is to slap tariffs on everything, from food to TVs. Now, understand what tariffs are. Anything that's coming from out, that, that's made elsewhere and comes here, you slap extra money on top of it. And if other countries are cheating, in some cases, it makes sense because you want to have a fair playing field. But what he's proposing is basically a Trump sales tax that could cost the average family almost $4,000 a year. So, so if you're concerned about higher prices, that is not the way to get lower prices. That's going to come out of your pockets. You think, do you think prices are high now? The, Donald Trump's message basically is, you ain't seen nothing yet. Donald Trump's absurd debate statement that he has concepts of a plan for health care was another opportunity for President Obama to ridicule the most incompetent president in American history. You heard it in the debate. Donald Trump's got one answer. E ending the Affordable Care Act that 45 million people rely on. Uh, the, 
the other day his running mate, J.D. Vance, had the had <laughs> You got a vote. The other day his, his running mate had the nerve to say, Donald Trump salvaged the Affordable Care Act. I, I mean, Donald Trump spent his entire presidency trying to tear it down. And by the way, he couldn't even do that right. And now, eight years after he was elected, when he was asked about what he was going to do, he says he's got concepts of a plan for how he'd replace it. Now, I want you all to think about this for a second. Let's say your boss gives you an ass assignment, a project. He says, I need this on Friday. And Friday comes around and he says, so, uh, did you finish that project I asked for? And he say, well, uh, I actually haven't started, but I have a concept of a plan. Or, or you could try it at home. Uh, honey, did you do the dishes? I have a concept of a plan to do the dishes. How's that going to go over? <laughs> if it wouldn't work for you, why in the heck should it work for the President of the United States? And even Vice President Harris's plan to help new parents gave President Obama another chance to lead the crowd in laughing at Donald Trump. So, if you're a new parent, you could qualify for a $6,000 tax credit during the first year of your child's life. Because I don't have to tell a lot of you, raising kids is hard. And she wants to make it easier to afford stuff like a crib or a car seat or diapers. I remember buying diapers. I, I, I remember the first time I went in the store right after Malia was born. I, I was like, what? That's how much diapers cost? I remember changing diapers. You think Donald Trump ever changed the diaper? <laughs> no! No chance! <laughs> <laughs> I almost said that, but I decided I shouldn't say it. President Obama challenged Donald Trump's record on immigration and border security. Well, Donald Trump was president for four years. And, and, and if rounding up and deporting millions of desperate people and building the beautiful wall and didn't matter whether some of those folks you rounded up were, were women and children, if that's the answer to everything, well, well why didn't you solve the problem? Why were the number of immigrants basically the same when you left office as when you took office? I'll tell you why. Because he didn't have a real plan. He had talking points. He had concepts of a plan. And the plan was mean and ugly. And it was designed to enhance his politics and make people angry, not to solve the problem. You know, what you, you know what would actually help bring order to the border and fix our immigration system? The bipartisan deal that Kamala Harris supported, even though it was written by one of the most conservative Republicans in Congress, the same bill that Donald Trump tanked on purpose President Obama reminded Pennsylvania voters who took away the freedom to choose. It has been fascinating to watch Donald Trump just tie himself into a pretzel on this issue. I mean, when he, was, when he ran for president the first time, he said he would support punishing women 
who got an abortion. That's what he said. Thank you. Now, <laughs> well, a couple weeks ago, what did he say? He said, don't worry, women. I'll be your protector. I'll tell you how he protected you. He handpicked three of the Supreme Court justices who overturned Roe versus Wade. Went out there and bragged about it. And now there are Trump abortion bans in 20 states, many of them with no exception for rape or incest. And he's and, and when you when he's asked about it, he he, he says, uh, well, everybody wanted it this way. Really? He thinks women want to have to drive hundreds of miles to find a doctor who can help them? Does he think doctors want to choose between letting a woman die or going to jail for giving her the life-saving care that she needs? That is not something people ch chose. Now, Donald Trump may be confused about that issue, but let's not be confused. President Obama attacked Donald Trump's recent lying about FEMA and disaster relief. Donald Trump at a rally just started making up stories about the Biden administration withholding aid from Republican areas and, and siphoning off aid to give to undocumented immigrants. Just made the stuff up. Everybody knew it wasn't true. Even local Republicans said it was not true. And now the people of Florida are dealing with another devastating storm. And I want you to watch what happens over the next few days, just like the last time. You're going to have leaders who try to help, and then they're... You have a guy who will just lie about it to score political points, and this has consequences. Because people are afraid, and they've lost everything, and now they're trying to figure out, how do I apply for help? And, and, and some of them may be discouraged from getting the help they need. The idea of intentionally trying to deceive people in their most desperate and vulnerable moments. And my question is, when did that become okay? I, I, I'm not looking for applause right now. I, I, I want to ask Republicans out there, You know, people who are conservative, I, who, who didn't vote for me, who didn't agree with me. I, I had friends who, who disagreed with me on every issue. When did that become okay? Why would we go along with that? President Obama closed his speech by speaking directly to men who might be reluctant to vote for a woman for president. I've noticed this especially with some men who seem to think Trump's behavior, the bullying and the putting people down, is a sign of strength. And I am, I am here to tell you that is not what real strength is. It never has been. Real strength is about working hard and carrying a heavy load without complaining. Real strength is about taking responsibility for your actions and telling the truth even when it's inconvenient. Real strength is about helping people who need it and standing up for those who can't always stand up for themselves. That is what we should want for our daughters and for our sons, and that is what I want to see in a president of the United States of America. And the good news is that you have candidates to vote for in this election that demonstrate that kind of character, who know what real strength looks like, who will set a good example and do the right thing and lead this country better than they found it. So, Pennsylvania, that is the choice in this election. It's not just about policies that are on the ballot. It is about values, and it is about character.
So whether this election is making you feel excited or scared or hopeful or frustrated or anything in between, do not just sit back and hope for the best. Get off your couch and vote. Put down your phone and vote. Grab your friends and family and vote. Vote for Kamala Harris as the next president of the United States. Vote for Tim Walz as the next vice president of the United States. Vote for Bob Casey and this whole incredible Pennsylvania Democratic ticket. Help your friends and family members and neighbors and coworkers do the same. Because if enough of us make our voices heard, we will leave no doubt about the election outcome. We'll leave no doubt about who we are and what America stands for. And together we'll keep building a country that's more fair and more equal and more just and more free. That is our task. That is our responsibility. Let's go do it. Thank you, Pittsburgh. Thank you, Pennsylvania. Let's go vote. Leading off our discussion is Democratic Pennsylvania State Representative Mandy Steele, who was in the room right there with President Obama at the rally today. Uh, and thank you very much for joining us, Representative Steele. I want to put up a picture we have of you uh, right over your shoulder uh, to show where you were in relation uh, to President Obama speaking there. Uh, it must have been a, a pretty uh, emotional experience to be in there with that crowd. And what do you think is the effect of President Obama's first appearance for this ticket occurring in Western Pennsylvania. Oh, it was a powerful effect, Lawrence, um, and that those last remarks that he gave to close out the night where he talked about real strength being hard work and taking responsibility and standing up for people, that brought the crowd to their feet and brought people to tears who were standing next to me because this is the messaging that people want to hear, and who better to deliver it than President Obama? I, you know, this is just impressionistic, and maybe the numbers would prove me wrong, but it seems that this harris Walls presidential campaign is concentrating more on Western Pennsylvania than Democrats usually do. This kind of event I'm more accustomed to seeing in Philadelphia. Uh, is this ticket uh, working Western Pennsylvania harder than previous Democratic tickets have? Yeah, they're working really hard in Western Pennsylvania, and we're so happy to have them here. The people that live here want to elect people that are going to show up for them and put in the work. And so I think that's made a real, real impact here. Um, and the the messaging around hope and op optimism and po positivity is resonating because our people that live in my district district in particular, but all across southwest western Pennsylvania, are being absolutely buried in really dark, dystopian, negative messaging um, from the other from the other party. And you know, in my case in particular, um, I am hit with a negative mailer. Uh, four or five times a week in my district. And the messaging is scary. And yet I grew up in my district. People know me from the time that I was little. They know my my mom and dad. We went to church together. And I'm, I'm raising four little kids here and they see me on the soccer sidelines and at the grocery stores. And they, at the grocery store, and they know that, that those messages are false and filled with lies. And what's been really amazing to see is that that's kind of lifted the veil on this whole approach, this whole dark um, negative approach, they're questioning that all the way to the top of the ticket. They see um, the Trump campaign hitting Harris with that kind of messaging, and and they're seeing through it now. And it's it's been remarkable to see that. And so Obama being here and pushing back on Trump and concluding with that really optimistic message, that was the exact right tone to strike in southwestern Pennsylvania at this moment. Pennsylvania State Representative Mandy Steele, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Thank you so much, Lawrence. Thank you.
President Obama made his first campaign ad of the season. We will show you that ad after this break, and we will bring you more of what Vice President Harris had to say tonight in Arizona later in the hour. President Barack Obama has made his first television ad of this campaign season, and here it is. Michigan, this is Barack Obama. I want to talk with you about the Alyssa Slotkin I know. Alyssa is a true public servant who has dedicated her career to serving the American people, no matter who is in the White House. I saw that leadership and character up close. In the Situation Room, Alyssa delivered national security briefings on some of the toughest issues we were dealing with. That's why I sent Alyssa to negotiate on my behalf because she understood when to compromise and when to stand firm. And it's why I nominated her to be an assistant secretary of defense. Alyssa is the kind of leader we need, tough, independent, and effective. She'll get the job done and she will make you proud. this message. Alyssa Slotkin is running against Republican candidate Mike Rogers for Michigan's open Senate seat. Mike Rogers is facing questions about where he actually lives and if he broke the law by voting at an address that is currently under construction. In a campaign debate Tuesday, Congresswoman Slotkin said this. I did not support overturning Roe v. Wade. Um, and if a bill came in front of the U.S. Senate to codify Roe, I would vote for it. But I think this is a really important distinction between the two of us. Mike Rogers was 20 years as a legislator. He voted for every single ban, every restriction, every bill that came across his desk to make it harder for a woman and to ban, in some cases, a woman and her right to choose. 56 times in total. We checked the math. To me, every single time he was casting one of those votes, he was saying something very particular. He was saying to women, he does not trust you to make your own decisions about your own family planning every single time. When it comes to our rights and protecting ourselves, I think it is important that we have someone in the seat who does that. He voted and sponsored bills that would make it impossible to have IVF and contraception. If he does not trust us to protect our own rights, do not trust him. Joining us now is Democratic Representative Alyssa Slotkin of Michigan. She is running for Senate in Michigan. Uh, it must be quite an honor to have uh, President Obama do his very first campaign commercial of the season for your campaign. It also seems to underline how important Democratic control of the Senate will be. Yeah, it's a big deal. I mean, it was, uh, you know, my honor to, to work for him. Um, I actually was there the first day that he walked in. I had worked for George Bush in the White House. And so um, I was uh, one of a handful that were kept on and had the opportunity to work for him. And um, we were really excited that he was willing to do that. And it means a lot to me. The, uh, the issue of abortion and women's uh, freedom to make their own decisions about their own bodies in Michigan could, seems to be as stark as it could be uh, in this Senate campaign. Uh, you're a supporter of Roe versus Wade. Your opponent, as you said, has voted for all sorts of bans over the years. Yeah, I just, you know, I think there's this thing going on right now across the country with a, a lot of Republican candidates where they, they sort of, you know, they literally stick their finger in the wind and see which way it's blowing and see that, you know, uh-oh, you know, a lot of people don't seem to like when we, you know, take away women's rights. Um, so I'm going to recraft, rebrand, forget about the past, ignore my history, and just convince you that I'm going to be the protector of women. And I mean, I just, if you believe these folks, I have a bridge I want to sell you. It's just not realistic. And past behavior is the best indicator of future behavior. Um, and they tell you who they are when they have the job. And in my case, uh, there was a, a man who had 20 years as a politician. So we, we have his votes. They're public. Um, so I just don't think we can let them get away with this idea of just going 180, rebranding, and we have to call them on their records. 
We have seen uh, the freedom to choose be a decisive issue in several states uh, since Roe versus Wade was overturned. Is it the number one issue in this Senate campaign, or, where, or if, if not, what is and what are, what are the top two issues, top two or three issues? Yeah, I, I think no matter what, no matter who you're talking to in Michigan, the economy, inflation, the future of work is definitely the number one issue. If you're a student and you're trying to figure out how to pay your bills, if you're ever going to be able to buy a home one day, middle-aged parents trying to buy that next home, um, not being able to afford it, seniors seeing their social security checks go not as far as they'd like them to. So uh, that's for sure the number one. But I think, you know, most people understand um, that while they're pocketbook voters at heart, you know, they, they just don't like the idea that we're going back on our rights. You know, Americans are used to getting more and more rights, not having them taken away. And, you know, that goes for people who, um, you know, maybe are Republican their whole lives and pro-life their whole lives. I had a guy come up to me um, in the airport and he said, I, I just wanted to shake your hand. I I'm a lifelong Republican, but, you know, I got three daughters. And I said, I know. And he's like, and those guys are so a mess. I don't know what right they'll take away next. I said, I know. So that to me is what it's about. It's not um, you know, the economy is definitely number one, but the issue of abortion is still very live because the other side of the aisle hasn't stopped going after it. I mean, not at all. Um, and then number two, it reflects a much bigger story, which is um, that in the chaos and in sort of that political only mentality, you could lose more rights by these guys just, just wanting to show off to their base. So um, it's still a very live issue, but the economy for sure is number one. Michigan Senate candidate Alyssa Slotkin, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we're going to have a mini West Wing reunion here with one of the directors of that NBC TV series where I worked as a writer. Jessica Yu has made a powerful new film about what the Trump abortion bans mean in the real lives of real women. That's next. One of my many lucky experiences working as a writer on the NBC series The West Wing was getting the chance to work with our next guest, Emmy and Academy Award winning director Jessica Yu, who was one of the <clears throat> brilliant directors of The West Wing. Jessica Yu is one of three filmmakers who have made short films for the Lincoln Project YouTube page, examining how the policies voters are considering in this election can affect individual lives. In Jessica Yu's film titled it Couldn't Happen Here. We meet two women, Alyssa Gonzalez of Alabama and Lauren Miller of Texas, who had their access to reproductive health care taken away when the Supreme Court overturned Roe versus Wade. I was four and a half months pregnant. We were getting the genetic screening test done. The doctor comes back and tells me that my son had tested positive for trisomy 18, which is a fatal form of Down syndrome. He was dying inside the womb. It started to unravel at the 12 week ultrasound visit. Baby A looked healthy and with baby B, you'd see these large fluid masses within our son's head. We were kind of thrown into a panic because not only was he suffering, but I was too. And we had a choice to make, and it was either put our child out of his misery and continue my life, or both of us were going to die. I just spoke with the genetic counselor from my OB's office, and it just gets worse. The genetic counselor just kept stopping mid-sentence, trying to tell me what I could do. All that she could tell me with certainty was that every day that this unviable twin continued to grow, the risks got greater and greater for the viable twin and myself. It was like she was gonna be arrested for saying the word abortion out loud. I was careening towards kidney failure. And I remember there were two doctors standing there and one of them just kept repeating, she just kept going, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, because she couldn't do anything, her hands were tied. I knew that I just needed to make it to Colorado. I just knew I needed to get to that plane. It's been over a year and a half. 
and I still wake up with nightmares. I sit up in the middle of the night, just in a cold sweat, just drenched with this feeling of being hunted. And it doesn't go away because the laws aren't changing. I was not the same after that. I was just empty, I felt cold. It wasn't just me. It was my family as well that I had to suffer. I never wanted to go through that again, so I just got a partial hysterectomy so I could never have any more kids. That killed my dream of having any more kids. For people who think they would never get an abortion, you could find yourself in a situation like mine where it didn't matter what I wanted, what I needed was an abortion. I can't be on the borderline of death for you to be able to do something. If there is something wrong with my child and he is dying and he is killing me, I should be able to receive care for that. And I think it's pretty messed up that I couldn't. Today in America, one in three women, one in three women of reproductive age lives in a state with an abortion ban. Women have been refused care during a miscarriage, turned away from the emergency room. This is a health care crisis. Joining us now is Emmy and Academy Award winning director Jessica Yu. Jessica, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, you know, watching this film uh, has been, and I know the audience already feels this, it, it is just such a powerful delivery of what all this means in real life, uh, as, as, as clear and as powerful as I've seen. Uh, when did you decide to do this, and, and what, what, what made you, f what, what helped you find the way to deliver this real life experience? Yes, thank you. Um, it was an invitation to tell stories, to actually personalize the essential issues at stake in this election. So in this case, um, of course, this is a, an issue that I feel strongly about, but I wanted to find people uh, who had personal stories that uh, would make these, you know, would, would make clear what we're facing in the upcoming election. Yeah, I, you know, when you hear things talked about in speeches, uh, <clears throat> it's just not the same as, as what, what, what you're able to present to us here. Right. And I think that this issue is much bigger than the soundbite. I mean, we have a lot of, um, there's, you know, such chatter from political ads. And this was a chance, actually, the mandate was not to make a political ad. It was actually to tell these stories. And so it's not just the women who wake up and find themselves in The Handmaid's Tale. You know, it's not just the doctors who are uh, trying to um, help their patients and find themselves facing, um, you know, possible jail sentences. It's also the bigger story, which is that this is an issue that has ramifications for everybody. What I found was that my own eyes were opened up when uh, realizing the, the domino effect of this. When a state bans abortion, you lose doctors, you lose OBGYNs who don't want to practice in a state where their essential health care that they provide might be criminalized. So you have maternity wards that close, you have hospitals that close. And so you might think that this is an issue that doesn't have anything to do with you. But if you're in a community and uh, you, you, know, you have a stroke and the nearest hospital is 100 miles away, this is an issue that will affect you. And so this is the kind of context that I was hoping this film could provide for, for people and uh, to know that these issues affect everyone. Yeah, I, I've been in hospital rooms, and as I'm sure many people have, where, where a very troubling diagnosis has just been delivered, and you can, you've can you heard patients say, well, I, I have to be strong, or I have to be strong for my kids. I never heard a patient say, I need to make it to Colorado. That is a whole different world. Uh, Jessica, you thank you so much for joining us tonight. We're going to try to find time on this program to show more of your film. It is the most powerful version of what this means in real life. Thank you very much, Jessica. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. It's good to see you. you. Great to see you, Thanks. Jessica. Thank you. And coming up, we will show you more from Vice President Harris's rally in Arizona tonight. That's next.
Here's more of what Vice President Harris said tonight at a rally near Phoenix, Arizona. Arizona, look, we have just 26 days until Election Day. 26 days. And we are nearing the home stretch. And this will be a very tight race until the very end. And we are the underdog. We are the underdog. <laughs> so, so we have some hard work ahead of us, but we like hard work. Hard work is good work. And with your help in 26 days, we will win. Just last night, Donald Trump officially ruled out any more debates. Now, I think it's a disservice to the voters. I also think it's a pretty weak move. But even if he will not debate, the contrast in this election is already clear. This election is about two very different visions, two very different visions for our nation. One, his, focused on the past. The other, ours, focused on the future. These and so many others are the issues that matter to you and your families, which is why you have taken the time out of your very busy lives to be here this evening. But that is not what we hear from Donald Trump. We don't hear about these issues. Instead, from Donald Trump, it's the same old tired playbook. He has no plans, no plans, for how he would address the needs of the American people. He is only focused on himself. Well, folks, it's time to turn the page. We'll be right back. Kamala Harris gets tonight's last word. 